Our text this evening uh, is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said these words. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. They're remarkable words. And they're words that demand a response. Two verbs that we must note in those words. That we must come. And that we must believe. And we're just going to consider these words of the Lord Jesus. When he said them, the context and why he said them. And of course what we, we must do in response to them. Well, to understand when the Lord Jesus spoke these words, uh, we'd have to go back uh, just a couple of chapters, or just back a chapter in the Gospel of John, and chapter 5. And we would read of a story that uh, is well known perhaps to many children. The story of the feeding of the 5,000. A story of when the Lord Jesus had been with many people and he had been performing miracles. They'd come to him in their need and he'd been able to heal so many. And he just went away from them for a little while after he'd healed so many because the Passover was coming and uh, he spent a little time alone. But as the day drew towards a close, he noticed that the crowd was still there. And one of the gospel writers tells us that he had compassion upon the multitude. This is ever the feeling of the Lord Jesus that he extends towards us. That of compassion. That of love. Even in heaven before he ever came and became a man where the word was made flesh, where God became incarnate, he had compassion upon the multitude compassion upon all of the needy of this world in all time and the Lord Jesus having seen the need of that group of people thousands of people he he, he just calls aside one of his disciples Philip and uh, he, he says what are we going to do about it uh, perhaps we should buy and, of course, he knew what he would do, but he wanted to see where Philip was. What was the state of Philip's faith? And it wasn't perhaps so that, that he doubted the Lord Jesus, but he didn't understand the Lord Jesus. And he, he suggested that, you know, a, a lot of money was going to be insufficient to buy what was needed to feed this crowd. Maybe we're at where, Philip, where we are at where Philip was. In that we, we, we see something in the Lord Jesus and we, we followed him and we, we, we're inquiring about him and we're interested by him. But we don't quite understand. We don't know him fully. We don't really understand why it was he came and what he chose to do and what we must do with him. Well, another of the disciples, Andrew, he sees a, a, a young lad who seems to have brought his pack lunch and he's got five loaves and two fish. And Andrew brings this one to uh, the Lord Jesus and he says, well, what are they among so many? Well, actually, what they ended up being was more than enough. <laughs> For the Lord Jesus, he, he takes that food and he asks all of the people to sit down and they're going to see a tremendous miracle an act of God. And, and the Lord Jesus, he, he prays and gives thanks for the food. And then he begins to distribute it to the many people. The disciples taking it back and forth. And we, we don't know how many times they went back and forth. But what we do read is that all of the people were filled. There were 5,000 men there that day. And there were women and there were children. So I'll leave you to think about how many there could have been. But every single one of them were filled. But not just them. Because the 12 disciples went around with baskets. And they collected up the remainder. And there was enough for them also. 
The Lord Jesus was able to satisfy everyone to their fill. And just after that, the, 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 the people thought, well, this one, that, that he's that prophet that should come into the world. And, and some of them tried to take the Lord Jesus and they wanted by force to make him their king. The Lord Jesus had been born king of the Jews. The wise men that came to visit him uh, in Bethlehem, they knew that. That's what they'd said to Herod. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? That's who he was. He was of the line of David. He was the promised one. But he wasn't going to ascend to a throne by the urgency of men like these. There was another route. The route that he had always chosen to take. A route that would take him to the cross first. And there was no way in which the Lord Jesus was going to bypass the cross. Here was a temptation. They wanted him to come another way. But the Lord Jesus would ascend to his throne via the cross. His throne first would be a cross of wood. His crown would be thorns weaved and put upon his brow. His scepter would be a reed that was given to him by the soldiers. His robe, a soldier's robe. And the adoration that he would receive would be the mockery. He wasn't going to go to the throne that way, the way they wanted. He would go to the cross first. And perhaps we'll just think about why that route in a few moments. But the Lord Jesus, he just slips away from them and he goes up into the mountain and the people disperse and they begin their journey around to the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee and onto Capernaum. But the disciples, they get into a boat and they cross over uh, towards the other side and in the early hours of that, the following morning, a storm whips up. And the Lord Jesus is praying in the mountain and he sees he sees their need and we haven't got time to look at this wonderful miracle, but he comes to them in their time of need, walking upon the sea. His complete mastery over the waves and the wind. Well, he would, because he created all these things. And the disciples, they think it's a ghost at first, and he tells them, it is I, be not afraid. I trust that you'll find comfort in those words. The disciples certainly did. It is I, be not afraid. Whatever are our needs in this life, the Lord Jesus can satisfy them and he can, he can solve and, and bring, to, to bring us to joy and to peace and to comfort. One of the disciples, Peter, at the Lord's bidding, he gets out of the boat and he begins to walk upon water. But he sees the wind and the waves around him and he, he begins to sink and he cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately the, the, the Lord Jesus takes his hand and he rescues him from the waves. And when the disciples bring Jesus into the boat, they say of him, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now we're revisiting this sto these stories and these words of the Lord Jesus because this is where we want to get to. An understanding, a complete realization that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. And of course that understanding and a coming to belief in that will draw a response from us to come, to believe and to follow. And it is after those events that the Lord Jesus comes to the people because actually he comes eventually to Capernaum and the people, they've gone around the lake and eventually they get there too and the crowd that he'd fed is now the crowd that is still seeking for answers and he speaks to them again and he t tells them, you seek me not because you saw miracles but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. The Lord Jesus knew the intentions of their hearts. 
You see, some of them were coming just really to satisfy their, their physical needs. He'd fed them once, maybe he'd give them breakfast now, he'd feed them again. And, and we just asked the question sincerely, but why are you here this afternoon? There may be all sorts of reasons why you've come. Maybe some have compelled you to come and you feel obliged to come and maybe you've got nothing else to do or maybe you find some comfort in these things and maybe you believe these things, but why have you come? Why have these come? Well, they've come for all sorts of different reasons, but have you come this afternoon because you believe? Or maybe is it because you want to believe? You want to find more out about the Lord Jesus? Well, whatever is your intention, the Lord Jesus knows your heart. And he says to them the words that we've read, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. And we just want to spend a little bit of time focusing in on those words. He said, I am. Now, in Sunday school, we've been learning the I am phrases of the Lord Jesus. In the Gospel of John, there are seven of them. He said, I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. And as we saw earlier on, in Revelation, he said, I am Alpha and Omega. But the first of the sayings is the one that we've read this evening. I am the bread of life. When he said, each, on each of those occasions, I am, it meant something much more to the people that heard it then than perhaps it does at first sight to us. Because in using those words, I am, the people would have gone straight away in their memories to events hundreds and hundreds of years ago, uh, close to the birth of their nation, when Moses was in the wilderness. He'd been 40 years a prince in Egypt and 40 years uh, tending sheep, and now God was going to appear to him. And as he's looking after the sheep, he sees a bush that is burning and yet is not consumed. And, and this just takes up his attention and he goes over to it and, and he's told to remove his feet because he, uh, his shoes because he's on holy ground. And he steps onto the sand near to the bush and, and, and he speaks to the voice that's coming out of it. And eventually he, he asks, who is it that's speaking to him? It's God. And God says to him, I am that I am. God reveals himself to Moses as the self-sufficient, the self-existing, self-sustaining, eternal God of heaven. And now the Lord Jesus is standing in front of this crowd of people and he's saying, I am. He's telling them, you may see Joseph the, carp the, jo Joseph the carpenter's son. You may see a prophet. You may see a teacher. You may see a miracle worker. But I am. God is here before you. And I think we need to grasp that truth of who Jesus is. He is God. Really, there'd be little purpose and worth us being here this afternoon if that wasn't true. I am. I am the bread of life. What he's telling them this is this. That on the one hand, food and drink are necessary for your physical life. And we all know that to be true. But he's saying, look, you need me for the sustaining of your spiritual life. I am the bread of life. 
just a couple of verses before we, we read in John chapter 6, verse 35, uh, that the Lord Jesus spoke of manna. Now, this goes back to the time of Moses as well. When Moses eventually, having gone down into Egypt, brought the people out from their captivity and they were set free and they went out into the wilderness. But in the wilderness, they needed food. And they cried out to God and God blessed them with bread from heaven, manna, they called it. It means, what is it? And they were sustained for all those years with bread from heaven, with manna. But the Lord Jesus, he turns to the people that he's speaking to now. And he says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. You see, he says, you as a nation, you enjoyed manna. But it was for 40 years and it was just for you. I tell you this. He says, I am the bread of life. And I come from heaven. And I've been sent of God and I am God. And the life that I give is for the whole world. I am the bread of life. <laughs> They're being introduced to something quite remarkable. The, the bread he's talking of himself is a person. He is able to sustain and to fulfill and to, and to keep alive spiritually. He's a person. He is life-giving. As his bread is able to feed us and keep us, he too is life-giving. The gift of God is eternal life. And God wants to give to each one of us that gift, the gift of God, life. But of course, this gift he's telling them is for the world. It's for everyone. We sang earlier of the whosoever. And the message of the gospel, the message that, is, that tells us that if we come believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and we can be saved, is for everyone. It's for the world. I'll just take a pause for a moment. Where are you in relation to these things? You might say, well, I don't need any of this. But actually, the Bible is quite clear in telling us that we do. Because the Bible tells us is that we are actually dead. Spiritually dead, dead in our trespasses and sins. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It tells us that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And that the wages of sin is death. And you might be saying, well, I I'm no sinner. Well, the Bible says that we all are. But you might say, well, I've done nothing wrong. And I think, actually... The Bible would challenge us as to that supposition. For while we might think of ourselves as being good, of being righteousness, God looks upon us and he says, no, you fail. You fail to live up to the mark. You miss the mark. You fall short of the glory of God. And even if it were possible that we had done no wrong, actually we fail to do the things that God calls us to. He says that it is his commandment that we believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And so it's possible to sin by not doing what God has told us to do, to trust in his son, Jesus Christ. So we are in need of this life that the Lord Jesus offers. And it is in him alone that it can be found. He is the bread of life. He is, as we read earlier, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the means of salvation. He is that because some months after the words that we are considering, he went to Jerusalem where he was arrested. He knew it was to come. 
And he was tried unfairly and condemned to death and crucified upon a cross. He bore more than the nails, more than the mockery. He bore the wrath of God on our behalf. He bore our sin in his body upon the tree. He died on our behalf. And he was able to cry at the end of that time of suffering, finished, because he dealt with the question of sin. Opening up a way of salvation, a way of hope, a way of forgiveness. I am the bread of life. But listen to the rest of the verse. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Those two verbs are so important. We must come. We must believe. To come to the Lord Jesus means this. To turn around. And to leave behind maybe the things that you once believed. All the philosophies and the, the ideas. Maybe a lifestyle. To turn around from that and to come to him. It is the idea of repentance. To say no to everything that you once depended upon. And say to the Lord Jesus, yes, I come. And I believe. To come and to believe, to completely trust, to depend upon the Lord Jesus alone, to trust and believe that he is the Christ, that he is God incarnate, to believe that he alone can save us, no other one, no other thing, no other way but him alone. To come, to repent, and to believe. They really are the same sides of this, uh, or, uh, two sides of the same coin. To repent and to believe. To turn from and to turn to. And the Lord Jesus invites us, invited them, invites us now to come and to believe. There is a promise. We didn't read them, but if you read on in John chapter 6, you'd read in verse 37, the Lord Jesus says, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. How wonderful that should we make that choice to repent, to come, to believe, he will receive. It's promised. He will not reject. He will not turn you away. He will receive you unto himself. And here's another promise in verse 40. Everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. We spoke about the wages of sin is death, but the verse goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life. Those that come and believe receive not only the gift of the Holy Spirit, but also the gift of eternal life in him but I'll leave you with this there is a warning in verse 36 the Lord Jesus says this to the crowd around him you also have seen me and believe not now you may or may not have listened to my words or the words of other preachers that have stood here in the past. You may have read these words for yourself in your Bibles. And you have seen, but chosen not to believe. Will you be amongst those that have seen, but have not believed? To reject him, to not come, to not believe, is to draw upon yourself God's ultimate condemnation, his judgment. For he will reject you outside of Christ. We needn't do that. We can come. We can believe. He will receive. Shall we just pray?